Welcome to Spell and Shield. In 2015, after several years of development and a successful Kickstarter campaign, the most successful to date at the time, in fact, the isometric CRPG Pillars of Eternity was released. In many ways, this was Obsidian's attempt to deliberately draw upon classic games such as Baldur's Gate and Icewind Dale for inspiration and to appeal to old-school RPG fans. It sold reasonably well, considering the small audience, well enough for Obsidian to launch their sequel, Pillars of Eternity 2 at least, which sold decidedly worse, subsequently leading to the potential death of the franchise, at least until we heard about Avowed. Whatever the flaws or lack of sales the isometric series Pillars of Eternity might have had, the simple fact that Obsidian decided to continue the world that they had crafted in Avowed tells us how much they valued this world they had created. However, the truth is that given that it was conceived in the form of an isometric RPG that did not sell very well, not many people will know much about the setting. This might of course change in time with the coming of Avowed, but there will still be two large games and the world and history that preceded Avowed, which is, as I've expressed before, a spiritual continuation of the Pillars series. And it is for this reason that I'm doing this series. I would like to explore the world of Aeora with you. To the Aeora newcomers, I want to help you settle into the series to prepare you for the arrival of Avowed. And for the veterans of the Pillars series, well, Maybe you would just enjoy hearing about the lore and world yet again. Aeora is the name of the world in which the series Pillars of Eternity has been set. And like many fantasy worlds, it has a rich history, and it is large and expansive. Thus far, only a fraction of it has been revealed to us in any detail in the games. There are several documented land masses in Aeora, which you might call continents. These are the Living Lands, Adir, Old Velia, the Eastern Reach, Rawatai, the Deadfire Archipelago, and the White That Wends. Within many of these land masses, there are diverse locations, peoples, and cultures, but certain geographical locations are characterized by particular things more so than others. Some are sparsely populated, and others are the seats of major civilizations and empires. Lying far to the north, the Living Lands is a massive island with highly variable terrain and weather. Valleys separate communities here, and there are tales of strange and bizarre creatures that roam the lands that exist nowhere else in Aeora. By all accounts, there are no permanent large-scale cities, and lawlessness is the law here, with conflict being rife between the communities that do exist here. Many different races live here, though not necessarily harmoniously. To the south of the Living Lands, there is the continent of Adir, which is also the seat of the most powerful empire of Aeora in the current age. Its climate is warm, as it is situated near the equator, most of the population of Adir is composed of elves and humans, a legacy of history when in the early days humans and elves joined together to form what would later become the Adir Empire. It is perhaps what one might call the most civilized and certainly largest civilization currently known on Aeora. Old Velia used to be the seat of a large and expansive empire that over time dissolved into other nations, such as the Velian Republics, as well as refugees and immigrants that left the place for the Deadfire often becoming pirates in the process, known as the Principi Sen Patrena. Today, what largely remains are petty squabbling nations that fight over the riches of what remains of the old empire. The Eastern Reach is a landmass with many distinct civilizations and cultures, and it is here that Pillars of Eternity takes place. The Eastern Reach is so named because many of the established societies were once colonies of the Adiran and Valian empires that later gained independence, but in addition to civilizations that have colonial origins, there are also older civilizations, such as the Iximitl and the Erglanfant that predate the colonized areas by centuries, and often fall into conflict with them. The Free Palatinate of Deerwood, which is a former colony of the Adir Empire, is the specific setting of the first game of the Pillars of Eternity series. Most inhabited by humans and elves, they divide their time up between the countryside and the city. To the northeast of the Deerwood is the penitential regency of Reasirtis, a theocracy that focuses on the worship of the deity Aeothus above all. It is infamous for being the starting point of the Saints' War, a massive conflict that involved both the Deerwood and Reasirtis, a topic we will explore in future videos. The Valian Republics are a breakaway confederation of nations within a nation that left the former Valian Empire to become independent city-states focused on trade and commerce, exploring the further reaches of Aeora in order to pursue profit. To the north of the Eastern Reach is situated the military nation of Rawatai. It was founded by a Mao refugees from the Dead Fire nearly two millennia ago. Lacking in agricultural resources, but rich in materials and resources for war, Rawatai has become a highly regimented, organized, and monarchical society. 
Highly collectivistic, the Rautines are mostly composed of coastal Amawa, but any group of people the Rautines conquer is integrated and becomes part of Rautai, thereby becoming Rautaian in the process. And to the east of the Eastern Reach lies the Deadfire Archipelago. It is the setting of Pillars of Eternity too. The chain of islands is largely inhabited by tribal island Amawa, but other races may be found in the archipelago as well, often for the purposes of trade. Largely ignored by everyone else in Aeora for countless centuries, the dead fire became of interest to the outside world when Rauatai recognized the fertile land, but even more so when the properties of the mineral called Luminous Adro were discovered, turning the dead fire into a hotbed of competing interests from around the world. And lastly, there is the White That Wends, which is the southernmost landmass in Aeora. The White That Wends is a brutal land of snow and ice, barely habitable, and the few who do inhabit the place tend to be pale elves and boreal dwarves. Although expeditions and explorers have attempted to brave the land, most meet with failure, and life in the White That Wends is marked by harsh survival at virtually any cost. Of course, the lands of Aeora are inhabited by people, and these people are collectively referred to as Kith, a term which refers to the so-called civilized races. While superficially there's overlap between Aeora's races and the races of many other fantasy settings, the elves, dwarves, and even humans vary at times significantly from many of the tropes we have come to know over the years, to say nothing of the kith races that are unique to Aeora. And so let me offer you an overview of the kith of playable races in the game of Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2, as there is a very good likelihood that these races will be making a return when Avowed comes out. Humans are in many ways just what you might have come to expect from many fantasy settings, with occasional twists and differences. They are by far the most ubiquitous race, found in most places, but with a few divisions amongst themselves. Within the human race are subpopulations, which tend to live in geographically distinct areas, having come from different regions thousands of years ago. Meadow folk, sometimes called Thirtan, originally migrated from the distant north many thousands of years ago, and are of light skin tone and eye color, and are the most common human subrace, found virtually everywhere in Aora. Ocean folk, sometimes referred to as Kalbandra, originated in the equatorial regions of Aora, who have dark skin and dark hair. They are almost as common as the meadow folk and are hyper concentrated in the Valian republics, in Old Valia, though often found elsewhere as well. The Savannah folk, alternatively called the Natlan, originate from the Iximital plains and are the human subrace that has moved and migrated the least, largely staying in their place of origin for thousands and thousands of years. Finally, although little is known about them, there is a fourth subrace referred to as the Storm Folk, from a distant land far to the east, with very little known of them, as powerful storms prevent travel between the east and the western parts of Aora. The Amawa are among the unique races of Aora, and are semi-aquatic humanoids that are larger and stronger than humans. The Amawa have been exploring the lands of Aora for untold millennia. There is a significant divide between the coastal Amawa in the north, who live primarily in the nation of Rawatai, than the island Amawa who live in the Deadfire Archipelago. Appearance-wise, coastal Amawa are blue and green, whereas island Amawa are brown and yellow in coloration. Culturally, the divide tends to be the greatest with the coastal Amawa typically residing in Rawatai and representing that culture, oftentimes very pragmatic and militaristic, and the island Amawa were more spiritual and less focused on regimentation and military matters. The dwarves of Aeor are, as one could expect, short and stocky in nature, and similar to dwarves of many other settings are divided into two subraces, boreal dwarves and mountain dwarves. Named after the southern boreal regions, unsurprisingly, boreal dwarves tend to hail from and dwell in the far removed southern island of Nazatak, which is reasonably close to the white that wins. Despite this, boreal dwarves, as do their mountain dwarf kin, tend to have a passion for exploration that belies their small size and can frequently be found abroad. Mountain dwarves, as the name implies, originally hail from mountainous regions of the continent eastward of the Eastern Reach, and have come over in varying waves over the millennia, and they tend to be more integrated into contemporary Aeoran society compared to their cousins. The elves of Aeora are lithe and slender, much like the elves of other worlds, and are divided into the subraces of wood elves and pale elves. Wood elves are the most common of the two, and originated near present-day Adir, they are the most populous race within the Adiran Empire, and are also found throughout the Eastern Reach and even the Deadfire. Pale Elves, by way of contrast, are the cousins of Wood Elves, 
and dwell in the frozen wastes of the white that wends. Possibly the most isolated and least mobile of the race of Sveora, they rarely leave the polar region they dwell in. Orlans might seem to be the halflings of Aeora, and they vaguely resemble the halfling fantasy meme. Orlans have been historically marginalized due to their small stature as well as their somewhat less civilized behavior, and many other races do not take them seriously to this day. Like the other races, there are two sub-races, Hearth Orlans and Wild Orlans, though in the case of the Orlans, both are documented to have originally come from the same region. Hearth Orlans left the original wilderness behind and over millennia evolved away from the Wild Orlans, becoming more sedentary and integrated into contemporary civilization, whereas Wild Orlans have not. Orlans are the hairiest of the Kith races, with Wild Orlans being even hairier than the Hearth Orlans. Of all the races of Aeora, Godlike are the most unique and most tied to the world setting. Unlike other races, Godlike can technically be born of any race, and will display the appropriate stature, size, and stockiness of their parents' race. But where they differ is in the divine infusion they receive from the gods. Rather than belonging to a conventional race, Godlike are alternatively blessed or cursed, depending on your perspective, by a particular god, and depending on the god, their appearance and abilities will vary tremendously. Godlike tend to be very polarizing figures in the Orin society, either drawing adulation and reverence, or hatred and reversion. And speaking of the gods, no setting would be complete without mentioning the gods of the world. Aeora has its own relatively small pantheon that oversees all religious matters. The gods of Aeora are universal, but are frequently known by other names to different peoples and cultures. The names I use here will be the most common names the gods are known by. Aeora is watched over by 11 deities, each with a different set of domains and responsibilities. Wudika is the queen and judge of the gods, though her rulership has frequently been contested over time. She is the goddess of law, justice, oaths, and rulership, and is also known, ironically, for attempting to circumvent laws and rules when they do not suit her. Judges, rulers, and lawyers understandably worship her, but so do many common folk who sign contracts and take oaths. Bereth is the goddess of death and the inevitability of the cycle of death, and to some extent, the goddess of portals and doors. Bereth is of indeterminable gender, as she often manifests in both male and female form. Bereth is a cold and logical figure, viewing death as an inevitability, applying neither mercy nor fear, but orderliness and consistency to the process. Death godlike are her children. Magron is the goddess of fire and war. This dual aspect makes her view war as a transformative force, as much as a destructive force, and sometimes she's viewed as a goddess of trials and purification. Soldiers of all stripes and colors worship her, and her followers are known for their passionate nature. Fire godlike are considered to be her children. The goddess Andra rules over the sea and oceans, and has a curious relationship with the moon. She's also known for being a goddess of loss and mourning. Anyone who sails the seas and travels by water takes heed of the goddess for favorable winds and currents. She is the patron of the moon and marine godlike. Abaddon is the god of smithing and the forge, but also of duty, preservation, and progress. Craftsmen and tradesmen worship him, as do most smiths who offer prayers to him so that he might bless their work. Galloway is the god of the hunt, of beasts and the wilderness. He is worshipped by not just hunters, but also explorers, scholars, and oddly enough even assassins. He is also the patron of the nature godlike. Whale is a strange god, genderless, and his portfolio comprises secrets, illusions, and dreams. Whale and his followers believe in preserving secrets and knowledge of misleading others, and its nature is not even well understood by the other gods. Helia is the goddess of birds in the sky, but also of motherhood, creativity, and the arts. A popular goddess, Helia is worshipped by many common folk, as well as artists and midwives. The avian godlike are considered her children. Scan is the god of secret hatred, violent rebellion, envy, resentment, and covert plots. He is typically viewed as the most evil and cruel of the gods, and most normal folk avoid associating with him at all costs. Those who do are typically desperate, insane, or both. Although Scan is alleged to have godlike, they are typically murdered after birth due to their hideous appearance. Aethys is the god of light, rebirth, and redemption and his followers strive to be kind, compassionate, honest, and aid others, eschewing cruelty and lies. Aethys is considered to be the kindest and most understanding of the gods, 
viewing Kith with greater compassion than the other gods. The final god of the Pantheon is, unironically, Remergond. Remergond is the god of winter, entropy, collapse, and death. Whereas Bereth represents the cycle of death and its inevitability, Remergond represents its finality, and by way of extension, the end of all things, the stillness of the void. Cold and different and sometimes cruel, even the other gods are terrified of his presence. The endings godlike are the creations of Remergond. Now I have to say we are truly at the very, very beginning of our exploration of Aora and its lore, and this video is very much only the tip of the iceberg. We'll be investigating and exploring many other aspects of Aeoran lore and history as we wind our way towards Avowed, when even more will be revealed. So like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.